Thanks. It's a great honor to be here today, standing on the TEDx stage alongside Jen French. Jen is an award-winning athlete. She's a Paralympian. She won the silver medal in sailing in the Paralympic Games in London in 2012. And she's gone on to win a number of awards since then in sailing. And while those are really great accomplishments, what's probably even more impressive is just the fact that she's standing here today. So in 1998, Jen sustained a spinal cord injury after a devastating snowboarding accident, and it left her quadriplegic, with limited use of her hands, legs, arms. But the very next year, she joined a research group right here in Cleveland that's developing technologies <coughs> to help restore function to people with paralysis. And I'm honored to be standing here today next to Megan, who is a brilliant biomedical engineer with a great policy and business mind. I met Megan last summer when she returned to the Cleveland area to lead up the effort at the Institute for Functional Restoration. And one of our first meetings took place while sailing out here on Lake Erie. And I quickly learned she's a much better engineer than she is a sailor. <laughs> but we're not here to talk about sailing. We're here to talk about design thinking. So I'm intrigued, and perhaps you are too, about the emergence of wearable technologies like Google Glass or the Samsung Watch. But really what I'm using here before you today is the ultimate wearable technology. And what we're going to talk about is the development of these technologies and how design thinking came into play. So when we think about design thinking, um, a lot of times we focus on architecture and modern furniture or even some consumer products, but we don't often think about medical devices. But a new trend in medical device development is this idea of design thinking, how to bring creativity, rational, rational problem solving, and even empathy for the end user to develop and design new technologies. So whether we're talking about a system that's designed to help pediatric patients avoid the pain of an injection, or an infant warmer used in developing countries, or believe it or not, a swallowable pill camera to, so that you can avoid the discomfort of a colonoscopy, or even a handheld medical device for consumers to track and trend their physiological state. These are all examples of medical technologies that are trying to use empathy for the end user. Probably one of the most powerful examples of this is external defibrillators. Now you see these out in public places, but you know that originally they were designed to be used by hospitals and clinicians, not by, by untrained users. So the designers of these devices now have you in mind when it comes to using this technology, because it's more likely to be an untrained user such as yourself, faced with the unfathomable situation of watching somebody suddenly collapse in front of you and having to be the first person to grab that defibrillator off the wall. Having never touched it before, you need to be successful the very first time you use it. So this is a great example of empathic design thinking when it comes to medical device development. So when we think about the system that Jen is using and we think about trying to develop solutions for people who use a wheelchair, what does it mean to be empathic to the needs of a person who uses a wheelchair? What does it actually mean to be a wheelchair user? So when we think about wheelchairs and the people who use them have impressions or stereotypes, and those have evolved over the years. And when we look at a wheelchair from just a few decades ago, that chair was designed to take a person from point A to point B. It wasn't designed for the person to self-propel, to have proper posture, or to move independently in the outside world. And with that, we develop these negative images of wheelchairs. We tend to think of people in wheelchairs as being wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair. When I was injured 16 years ago, I had to go through the exercise of ordering my first wheelchair. And I needed a tool to be able to move independently outside of the rehab hospital. But I had this negative image. I wanted my wheelchair to be dark and invisible. I wanted people to see me and not the wheelchair. So, when we think about the image that people purvey, look at the chair that I'm using today. It's an elegant design about the evolution of the modern wheelchair. Today, modern wheelchairs offer extraordinary design in giving people an array of functions, like being able to compete in a marathon or going over rough terrain. But what does a wheelchair really mean to someone who's paralyzed? For me, it's more than a vehicle to get from point A to point B. It's really a means to be able to self-propel, to be able to move independently and have meaningful function in the world, and also to convey an image. For me, my wheelchair is not just a tool. It's a means of self-expression. But even the, most, the best designs of modern wheelchairs still have limitations. There's architectural barriers, like descending those long steps onto a tranquil beach, or 
being able to fit through that narrow doorway at a friend's or family's home. And there's societal limitations as well, like trying to reach that product on the very top shelf or participating in a standing ovation or the seventh inning stretch of a baseball game. Even the best of modern wheelchairs today still have limitations that technology is yet to solve. So when we think about creating solutions for people who use a wheelchair, we can't just get rid of the wheelchair. It's so much a part of their self-expression as well. We want to envision technologies that help integrate with the wheelchair. So to understand a little bit about how gen systems systems work, it's important to understand that for people with spinal cord injury, they lack movement and sensation because signals to and from the brain can't get past the damage in their spinal cord. But what's interesting is that it turns out that in many cases their muscles are fine. It's just that they can't receive activation signals from the brain. But they can be activated with low levels of electrical current. And this phenomenon has been known for a really long time. But it wasn't until the 70s and 80s that pioneering researchers right here in Cleveland laid down the foundation for this new field called neuromodulation. They envisioned a technology that would allow you to coordinate the activation of many muscles into functional movement, like standing, or stepping, or even hand grasp. So the system that Jen is uh, modeling today has uh, 24 wire electrodes that are actually underneath her skin. And they, they make close contact to the nerves that activate her muscles for standing. At the other end, they're connected to a controller that allows the coordinated motion of all of those muscles. And so with the press of a button, she can stand up or sit down. So coming back to design thinking for just a moment, one of the things we look for in technological solutions is simplicity. So you'll notice that the designers of the imagining a system for standing for paralysis, they didn't envision a huge robotic system that's gonna hoist Jen out of her chair, and they weren't imagining a big exoskeleton that she has to wear, because just look at Jen. She doesn't need another skeleton. She already has a skeleton that she wears on the inside, like the rest of us do. And she doesn't need a lot of motors and actuators because movement can come from her own muscles that can still be activated. So the cool design principle here is simplicity. This idea that it can connect to the parts of the nervous system that still work and substitute for the parts that don't. So it turns out as impressive and exciting as it is for able-bodied people to watch somebody with paralysis get up and out of their wheelchair, it turns out that standing is not the only thing. No, and how exciting standing is, the reality of it is, is that people with spinal cord injuries have a lot of different priorities. When we look at Dr. Kim Anderson's work, who happens to be a quadriplegic herself, she highlights what the priorities are for people with spinal cord injury in terms of restoration of function. And when we look at the data, we see that standing and walking rate lower on the priority list. The reality of it is, is that both groups want to be able to empty their bladders, quads want hand function, and paraplegics want the ability to have sex. But design thinking tells us that we should be empathetic and be able to restore all of those functions. And the fact is, is that we can. With the system that I use today, the next generation is now, for the first time, being able to be customized so you can allow multiple functions for people with spinal cord injury. So neuromodulation systems look like this today. They are totally implantable now. Everything is on the inside, so there's no external components. And it's modular, and the, com and the system talks to itself like a, like a network computer system on the inside of the body. So if you want to add new functionality, it's like adding peripherals to your computer system. You can use the same modular approach to design these. So one of the challenges here, though, is the fact that it's not enough to just have a great technology if you can't get it to the people who use it. And one of our biggest challenges is the fact that when it comes to restoring uh, function for people with spinal cord injury, spinal cord injury is one of our smallest patient populations that we're trying to, to help. So if we look across the spectrum of what we call orphan markets, these are the diseases and conditions and states that, that uh, reflect very small populations in our, in our country. And it's very unusual and, and, uh, for, for com companies to actually move into this space to commercialize. And I'm a member of that orphan population. But along with all these conditions come high health care costs. For spinal cord injury alone, the lifetime, lifetime cost of care averages between one and five million dollars for each person. The cost of care for spinal cord injury is not proportional to the size of the population. The fact of the matter is, is that people with spinal cord injuries have daily battles against life-threatening complications like infections, 
pneumonia, and kidney failure, along with other conditions like scoliosis, muscle atrophy, and osteoporosis. When I was injured 16 years ago, I was faced with the fact that I would be paralyzed and have to start this daily battle against medical complications. And I did what so many people with spinal cord injuries do. We start to hunt for a solution. And on that hunt, it led me back to Cleveland to join a clinical trial here at the Cleveland FES Center. 14 years ago, I was implanted with this neuromodulation system that allows me to stand before you today, to move independently, to overcome barriers, and to combat those life-threatening medical complications. But it also allows me to rejoin the upright world in societal ways, like standing at the seventh inning stretch of a baseball game, even though a lot of you are missing the Indians' open, opening game today. <laughs> but 14 years later, this system is still not available for the average person with spinal cord injury. I'm fortunate because I joined a clinical trial to be able to have access to it. But still, 14 years later, the system would have to overcome hurdles just to make it commercially sustainable. 14 years later, it's not available to the average person with spinal cord injury. It's not available to people like me. We really have to ask ourselves whether design thinking can help here too. Can we use creativity and rational problem solving and empathy for the end user to imagine a business prospect, a commercialization plan that can help bring these technologies out of academic research and all the way through to commercial reality? It's so imperative that we be able to do this. So the Institute for Functional Restoration has that as its goal. Our mission is to bring restorative functional technology like this to people like Jen and other people with paralysis to help restore function again. It's critical that we be able to do this because there is no other technology that even comes close to providing this level of restored function. And in all the years that we've been waiting, there's still no cure for spinal cord injury. So it's imperative that we do succeed so that more people like Jen can rejoin the upright world. Thank you.